to make up those here at the service. Waiting expectantly, representatives of the Commonwealth, we've got presidents, prime ministers, high commissioners, but also senior political figures from across the political spectrum. Alex Salmon there, the First Minister of Scotland, behind him the Chancellor, George Osborne, and of course Kate Hady, who will take a part in the service shortly. There you can see in the front row the Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg, the leader of the opposition. And hidden in the middle of there, you can't quite see him, the Defence Minister, Lord Astor, here specifically because he is the grandson of Earl Haig, the Commander in General. And here too we can see the Governors General, Scotland and Australia, and my colleague Anita Rani spoke to them a little earlier. Yes, various guests and dignitaries are filtering into Glasgow Cathedral for the beginning of the service which will take place at 10 a.m. this morning. And I'm now joined by the Governor General of Australia, Sir Peter Cosgrove. Sir Peter, thank you very much. Now, in 1914, Australia had a population of about 4 million and 400,000 men signed up. They weren't, there were no conscriptions, they enlisted to join. Why was there such a strong commitment from Australia? I think there was a deep emotional commitment to the British Empire and there was a thought that while we were a dominion in those days, our, our roots were very plainly uh, back with the mother country and that there was a sense that our security uh, was enmeshed with the events in Europe. Indeed. And we talk of it as a world war, but for Australians and a lot of the soldiers from all over the Commonwealth who fought, it really was a global war, wasn't it? It certainly was. Australians uh, initially enlisted to fight in Europe, but ended up fighting as well in the Middle East on the way through, uh, uh, in Gallipoli, of course, and then ended up on the fields of France and Flanders for the bulk of the war, even while leaving thousands of our soldiers to fight on against the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. And when you're in the cathedral this morning, Sir Peter, uh, what will you be thinking about? What does it mean to you to be here today? Well, you spoke about those over 400,000 men and women who signed up and wore their country's uniform in far-off fields. I'll be thinking of them. Also, of course, of the 60,000 who were killed, that remains the highest level of casualties per enlistment uh, for Australia. Uh, 156,000 were wounded or gassed or made prisoner and uh, all of those lives and their families were deeply affected. Uh, Australia lost its uh, international innocence, if I could put it that way, in World War I, and we are a wiser, if not necessarily uh, always a trouble-free nation. Sir Peter, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me this morning. Thank, thank you. you. Now let's hear from some of those voices from soldiers who did fight in the trenches. These memories were recorded in 1973. Ghastly hell. It was just mud, mud, mud. Trench is half full of mud. Oh, frightful. You've no idea what it was like. You lived in dugouts and you were pretty well over your ankles in mud all the time. You just had a ground sheet over you, you wake up in the morning with the snow over your feet and you were everlastingly in dampness. I'm now joined by the Governor General from New Zealand, Sir Jerry Mataparai. Sir Jerry, thank you for talking to me this morning. Now, again, New Zealand, a tiny nation in 1914. One million people, yet again, 10% New Zealanders fought uh, during World War I. Why was there such a commitment? There was a connection, you know, like Australia, to, to the, mother, the motherland. Um, lots of our people had claimed their roots from you know, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and, and England. So there was a deep connection. The majority of our soldiers, though, were born in New Zealand. Um, we were British, you know, claimed to be British as well. So there was that very strong sense. There was also a sense of community at home and, you know, joining up with mates and going off a, on a big adventure. Um, unfortunately, it didn't prove to be that much of an adventure. But it wasn't just uh, people of British descent in Australia who'd signed up. There were over 2,000 Maoris. That's right. 2,200 Maori uh, and also 500 Pacific Islanders you know, fought during the First World War. And you know, we fought in Gallipoli alongside the Australians uh, on, on the fields in, in France and, and now Belgium uh, and also in the Sinai. 
And of course, this is it's also this service this morning has a deeply personal meaning to you too, doesn't it? It certainly does. You know, my two grandfathers fought in the First World War. One of them, my paternal grandfather, was wounded twice, gassed, and had to return home and left. And so we're also, you know, remembering the people in Britain who supported us at Brockenhurst, in Walton on Thames, on Codford, you know, where our hospitals and where our soldiers um, can be left. Uh, sir, sir Jerry, thank you very much for talking to me. I know you've got to get into the cathedral because you'll be uh, talking this morning, but thank you very much for taking the time welcome. to talk to me. Thank you. Very so some of those taking part in uh, Glasgow and we'll be back there in the cathedral in uh, just a few minutes for when the service starts. Um, so important for us to underline here again, you know, that service is all about celebrating, in the right sense of that word, the courage and the great sense of duty and, of course, the sacrifice of those who took part in the Commonwealth nations. And one of the most remarkable stories involved the Indian Army, which uh, began to mobilise just four days after Britain declared war. By the late autumn of 1914, one in three soldiers under...